Mornings at my grandparents' house in Cincinnati, Ohio, were always quite loud. Before it was in fashion to grind your own coffee, my grandmother would plug in her coffee mill and wake up the entire house so she could fill up her mug to the brim with milk and sugar. Along with her coffee, each weekend she would go out to the front door to collect five or six different newspapers. Afterwards, my grandparents' morning reading would commence. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Cincinnati Inquirer, the Washington Post, and the American Israelite, Cincinnati's Jewish Weekly. When I would come into the kitchen for breakfast, I would have to place the stacks of newspapers somewhere else so I would have a place to sit. One stack for my grandmother, the Democrat, and the other stack for my grandfather, the Republican. Despite the political leanings of the periodical collection, they each read some of both and shared interesting articles with each other. They spent over 60 years together in a politically mixed marriage. It wasn't a secret and no topic was off the table. Politics were important to both of them, but it never got in the way. How different that is from our current situation. As a millennial myself, I have never subscribed to a paper edition of a news periodical. So often, our news sources come from algorithms from Facebook and Twitter and Apple News so that we only see what the equation thinks we want to see. We turn on the television for a political update, and it's either MSNBC or Fox News. These media sources are designed to appeal to our base assumptions and rile us up so that we keep coming back for more. The more outrageous, the more viewers, the more money they make, the more influence they have. I don't want you to get me wrong here. This is not an anti-media statement. Free press is incredibly important and one of the pillars of our democracy playing a vital role in our understanding of historical norms and current happen happenings, as well as critical updates and facts about COVID-19. However, when we only see the world through the lens of one newslet out, news outlet or the other, we risk never meeting another viewpoint different from our own, further distancing ourselves from people with whom we may disagree. I know, I can hear all of the arguments right now coming through the screen. I get it, I get it. But what about climate change? What about socialism? What about kids in cages? What about Obamacare? What about the courts? What about America first? To tell you the truth, those arguments are going to be there tomorrow. They aren't going anywhere because one side is shouting louder than the other. Just a week and a half ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. We are not quite in the period of Shloshim yet as she has not yet been buried. There have been countless words written about her in recent days, though still not equaling the number of words she wrote as a judge on the highest court of the land. So much of what we know about her is how she fought for justice for those who sought it. One of the legacies that she's leaving behind is her ability to dissent, to disagree without malice or unkind words. She was known for maintaining positive relationships with conservative colleagues, most famously Justice Antonin Scalia, even when they bitterly disagreed with the direction of a particular case. She wrote in an article in 2016, when a justice is of the firm view that the majority got it wrong, she is free to say so in dissent. I take advantage of that prerogative when I think it important, as do my colleagues. Despite our strong disagreements on cardinal issues, think, for example, on controls of political, 
campaign spending, affirmative action, access to abortion, we genuinely respect one another, even when even enjoy one, of the, one another's company. This quote is evidenced by the fact that Scalia and Ginsburg were known for taking vacations together in their free time. Imagine spending that much time with someone with whom you disagreed so much and had the power to influence an entire branch of government. 2,000 years ago, two of our most famous rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, each led houses of learning that disagreed about almost everything. For example, Shammai would say that we should start by lighting all of the lights the first night of Hanukkah on the Hanukkah and diminish them one night after that because that's how the oil lasted in the temple. Hillel, on the other hand, would say no, we should start by lighting one night each night, one light each night until the entire Hanukkah is full so as not to diminish light. Think about which one we follow. Their disagreements were many, and the fact that we have records of them is novel. Hillel and Shammai taught us about the power of dissent, not hatred, not canceling each other out, but about the mere fact of disagreeing, yet remaining one people committed to an ongoing conversation about Jewish life. Last week, I participated in a webinar hosted by the Central Conference for American Rabbis about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy as a jurist and a Jew. One of the presenters, Moshe Helbertal, who's a professor of law at Hebrew University, taught a text by Maimonides, who was commenting on the Sanhedrin text and the Talmud. This text deals with capital punishment in court. If the court comes to a unanimous decision in favor of capital punishment, the person being convicted would be exempt. They would go free. So if everyone on the court decided that this person should be killed, he would end up going free. The text asks, why? And the answer they give is because a majority without a dissent who does not face any friction or counter-argument is blind and cannot be trusted. Halbertal says, every time you see unanimity, that means something went wrong in the discussion. In matters of life and death without dissent, the person cannot be convicted. Without a dissenting view, the discussion is hollow and blind. Our entire Jewish law is based on the idea of dissent and differing opinions. And yet we have gotten so far away from this idea in our current culture. Instead of accepting that other people are going to have different opinions, we see their disagreement as an existential threat. What we should strive for is allowing for the dissent and disagreement. In 2020, disagreement has become synonymous with disgust and hate, one side against the other. Our Torah teaches in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, a verse that we'll hear later this afternoon, it says, you shall not hate your kin in your heart. The rabbis go on to say, well, maybe, perhaps, this means that you shouldn't hit or curse another person. And they ask further, are only physical and verbal violence condemned based on this verse? And the rabbis say no. This verse teaches that we should not hate in your heart, speaking here of the hatred in one's heart. Yom Kippur is our day of rebuke, of tochacha in Hebrew. 
Not only are we supposed to ask for forgiveness, but we are to call out places where we can do better. So consider this our communal tochacha. Our Jewish tradition is calling us to be better and do better. We do not need to stoop to the level of political pundits and shout each other down because we have differing opinions. People have already made up their mind for whom they're going to vote for on November 3rd. Let's figure out a way to live these next 37 days before the election without reaching to the depths to which we might be drawn on both sides of the political divide. This may seem impossible. It may be impossible if we don't try. But today, we are supposed to imagine the best of ourselves and try to achieve that. We may never get to the point of sitting down for a morning cup of coffee with everyone for whom we disagree, coffee grinder whirring in the background and newspapers all over the place. But we might consider that dissent and disagreement are part of life and according to our Jewish tradition, should be honored. What I am asking us to do today is not bring hate into the equation when it comes to disagreements. This is really, really hard. But Yom Kippur teaches us that we can do hard things. We owe it to ourselves and to our sanity to give it a try. Gmar Chatima Tovah.